Sorry, I was just trying to give the sound engineer a bit of a nightmare. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. A planet for sale. Imagine there's a galactic real estate brochure and some clever estate agent was trying to sell our planet. What would they say? Wonderful buying opportunity, two-thirds of the way outside from the center of the galaxy, uh, 51 billion hectares of land, 356,000 kilometers of coastline, um, quiet neighbors, um, a bespoke moon that gives a lovely uh, cosmic nighttime setting, and most importantly for us, a great restoration opportunity. But what if one of those buyers was uh, a corporate and wanted to turn planet Earth into a company? And they wanted to look at Earth's books. Hmm, bit of a problem there because, firstly, on the balance sheet, it's hugely undervalued. As we only record financial capital, we don't record social and natural capital. Big problem for a buyer. Secondly, on the profit and loss account, we've actually got auditors looking at this now because Although we've recorded the revenues, we've actually fraudulently recorded the costs. Take agriculture as an example. The costs of agriculture are three to five times the revenue. We're making a loss farming the planet. And yet we carry on doing it because that's what we know best, what we think we know best. So there's a bit of a problem there for a startup. And thirdly, cash flow statement, because our non-current assets, including land, uh, we haven't been depreciating. Now, if you do run a set of accounts, you know that you depreciate property and plant and equipment, and land typically doesn't have any depreciation uh, attached to it. But the way we manage our planet, it really should do. And a key part of this is the framing. And so, you know, we know that Einstein Einstein had some wonderful theories, the theory of gravity, the theory of relativity, the theory of light. Sadly, he didn't have a theory of restoration. But if he did, I think he would follow his own advice. And that is to put a lot more attention into design, conceptualizing, framing, understanding. And all of the attempts I've seen so far to do this, as most rush to implement, rush to set up projects, has been that of the Global Restoration Council. And this very simple but fantastic diagram describes what we currently have and what, where we want to end up. And it's a wonderful diagram. I'd ask you to go to the Global Restoration Council and download it and use it, because it's very simple but it does give us a wonderful framing for those degraded lands that firstly, we want to restore agricultural lands into better production and sustainable production. Secondly, to restore forest areas. And thirdly, to create some of those mixed forest systems. I'd like to use um, four, three countries as case studies to show you how that framing can help us. The first one is Sri Lanka. Now, that, those two images show you a difference over 10 years of soil organic carbon. Soil organic carbon or soil organic matter is that wonderful thing that holds sand and silt and clay together. It stops your soil being eroded. And remember, it takes 100 years to build two centimeters of topsoil, 100 years. And we can lose it in a single rainfall event. It's what makes your soil full of biodiversity. It wants to make it a sponge rather than a sieve when it rains to hold water. And look at the degradation of that particular resource in Sri Lanka. And so the government have started a, uh, a presidential initiative called Land Health is National Wealth to bring in that natural capital accounting, to bring in that green economy that doesn't offset uh, the environment against financial gain. Second example, Côte d'Ivoire, a country which produces 40% of the world's chocolate. 40%. Now, they did have 10 million hectares of Upper Guinean forest, and over the last 50 years, they've lost 94% of that. So they lost an asset that is worth $150 billion, 
And how much revenue do they have for their cocoa? Over the last 50 years, 120 billion. Making a loss. It's a rich man's indulgence for a poor man's labor and a poor country's loss. And so we've been working with um, the government of Cote d'Ivoire to change that, in that framing, in that design. And it's not a deforestation problem. It's not a cocoa production problem. It's a combination of problems that you need to simultaneously address. And if we don't simultaneously address those problems and look at the interconnections of them, we're not going to be restoring landscapes because it's about restoring communities, restoring social cohesion, restoring rural transformation opportunities. It's not just the physical planting of uh, vegetation. The third example, Ethiopia. This is a photograph from uh, northern Tigray at a time after the Derg in the middle 1990s when there'd been a number of pronounced droughts, there was almost no vegetation on the land, very poor pro productivity, very little water holding capacity, very little opportunities for rural enterprises. Huge migration from those areas to cities, and indeed the government was excluding people, setting up exclosures and taking people off the land for their own good. And this is one of those sites. We kind of discount social capital, but it was social capital that transformed that landscape. It wasn't money, it was social capital. And what the community decided was, if you want to call yourself a member of our village, you have to spend 40 working days a year, every man and woman in the village, 40 working days a year in the watershed, planting trees, building check dams, excluding livestock, and putting in flood barriers. Okay? And in two, over 20 years, it did take 20 years, it went from that to that. Even after two years of no rainfall, there's still water flowing in the river. The water table has gone from 12 meters down to one meters down. There's only 900 villages in this, uh, 900 households in this entire village. But 1,350 youth have come back from cities and towns to the village. To, um, to be business people, to be input, to drive motorbikes and deliver produce, to connect with the cities and that rural area. And it was largely based on social capital, a fantastic example. And so what we're hoping in that galactic real estate brochure is that it actually gets withdrawn from sale. It's not put up for auction. It's not on an as-is, where-is basis, and let the buyer beware. Because the seven and a half billion tenants in this planet, we don't own it. We're stewards for the next generation. And we want a buyout. We want uh, the tenants to take responsibility for that resource. But to do that, we have to make sure we're working in a cross-sectoral way, in an integrated, putting a lot more attention into design. Secondly, Establishing a real price of carbon. Because I love uh, the Red Plus initiatives, I love the work of the World Bank, but when we treat forests just as carbon, and particularly at $2 a ton, it's a tragedy. Why? Because could you convince Vladimir Putin or the Saudi oil princes or Venezuela to take oil out of the ground we, and stick it in a barrel. We know a barrel has 160 liters. We know it has a specific gravity of 0 0.85. We know it has 84% carbon content, 112 kilograms of carbon, 400 kilograms of CO2. At $2 a ton, that's 80 cents. Would Vladimir Putin dig oil out of the ground, refine it, stick it in a barrel, and put it in a warehouse for 100 years for 80 cents? No. So why should we expect developing countries to do that with their forests? We need that $60, 80 $100 a ton, a, a, a tax on carbon to really drive that. Attract more capital. And we talk a lot about blended finance, but it's really about blended development and blended risks. And if we can achieve those five things, 
then we will have a future for our planet. If we can achieve those five things, it won't be a new business startup or a business as usual closed down, but an opportunity for us to prosper and to have that intergenerational gift of being wonderful land stewards. Thank you for listening.